This is the first EPIC uh, seminar of the year. It's a special two-part program. Uh, Bob Kopp and Michael Oppenheimer. Uh, Michael's talk is, I think, October 14th. I'm making that up. I'm not sure that's Wednesday, but uh, it's certainly on the web. Uh, so Bob is a climate scientist, earth historian, and geobiologist. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Rutgers and associate director of the Rutgers Energy Institute. Uh, many, many accomplishments. One mark of shame is that we worked together uh, in uh, government for one year, and I, I brought Bob down uh, left and right. And uh, his research focuses on understanding uncertainty in past and future climate change with major emphases on sea level change and on the interactions between physical climate change and the economy. Uh, and he's a true expert on sea level rise. And also, again, in my effort to defame Bob, we're involved in a joint project uh, estimating the so trying to estimate the social cost of carbon. So uh, welcome, Bob. And we have a special gift for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Am I supposed to open this now or later? Uh, it depends on the talk, though. <laughs> <laughs> University of Chicago uh, notebook. All right, thank you, Michael. It's a uh, real. Uh, Pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been several years since I've back, been back at UFC, and campus is looking uh, great. Um, so I want to talk to you today about sea level rise. Um, and I want to motivate that with, with two observations. Um, so first, you know, sea level rise has, a, has an impact of climate change, um, is of importance in and of itself. It's of importance because roughly 1 in 20 of the world's population lives within 6 meters vertically of sea level and so is exposed um, to flooding, uh, both as a result of sea level rise and of storm surge. But it's also sort of intellectually of interest um, has a model program, model problem for thinking about the impacts of climate change because compared to many climate change impacts, it's actually relatively simple. Right? The dominant parameter is one single variable, sea level, that varies over space and time. Um, but there's a degree to which the, the, the uncertainties in this problem can sort of be unbounded. Right? We know what the maximum possible sea level rise is. Uh, it's a lot, but there's a limit. Um, the effects of sea level rise being faster than we, we think it will be could be catastrophic, but it's still water going up, and so the basic problem is not going to compl complicate itself. There's not going to be surprising emerging interactions like there are as we think about ecological or biogeochemical shifts, or potentially are. Uh, so it's a problem where we can go from sort of basic physics and geology of the problem to an assessment of future risk to thinking about decision-making frameworks for adaptation. Um, and what I want to walk you through today is a very quick survey of different elements of the problem, each of which could be its own talk in and of itself. So the work I'm going to show you today um, is a result of a whole bunch of different projects with a very broad research team, a number of whom's members are featured here. Um, I'm not going to name everybody, but I just want to call out a couple of collaborators. Um, so first of all, Michael Oppenheimer, who's going to be giving the next talk in this series, is my former postdoc advisor and a, a close collaborator and a neighbor down the road at Princeton. Um, Maya Buchanan, who is a graduate student, we, we're both co advising, um, has been very involved with some work I'll show later about how we incorporate uncertain probability distributions into decision making. And then I'm going to briefly show some historical work from the teams in the upper left, upper right and bottom right. Um, and then we'll talk about some results from the American Climate Perspective Study, an economic risk study of climate change impacts on the US. And we'll focus on how those relate to the sea level rise projections. And some of you may know some of the participants in that group, including Amir Gina, who's a postdoc here. So I want to address a series of five questions as we go forward. So first, briefly, I'll talk about the problem of global and local sea level change, what the driving factors are and why they're different. Um, then how we can use our understanding of sea level physics to interpret what's happened in the past and in the 20th centuries and use those to improve our projections for the future. Um, so for those of you who are coming from non-science backgrounds, this will be the, the sciencey bit. Um, then we're going to say, okay, what do we do with this information? How do we synthesize multiple lines of knowledge to assess future risks? What are the implications of those projections? And as we start to get more on the economic side, um, and how do we potentially manage uh, those risks? So to start, and I, and I should say, I'm, I'm happy to be interrupted throughout. Just let me know if you have a question. 
So at a globally average scale, um, you know, the factors contributing to sea level rise are relatively simple. Um, you have two major factors. So one, water, as it increases in temperature, expands. So that gives rise to thermal expansion. Um, density changes there, right? So thermal expansion. Um, and then secondarily, right, if you take ice that's sitting on land and you melt it and you put that water in the ocean, that increases sea level. Um, and there's a third contribution um, from changes in the amount of water stored on land. Uh, some of that, those changes are natural fluctuations, but the dominant contribution are either groundwater withdrawal, so pumping water out of the ground ultimately so that it runs into the ocean, or building dams to impound water on the land. So these have an effect on sea level. If we look at the relative contributions of these different components over the last 20 years, um, what we find, out, find is that roughly half of the sea level rise over the last 20 years has been due to different combinations of sources of ice on land, with mountain glaciers uh, being the dominant contribution, and then secondary contributions from the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the, after the land ice, uh, we've got a significant contribution, larger than the glacier contribution, but smaller than the total land ice contribution from thermal expansion. And then there's sort of this tertiary contribution uh, from land water storage, so from groundwater withdrawal. So this is the shape of the problem today. And if this were the only the scale of the problem, it wouldn't be too much to worry about. Um, but in fact, particularly this land ice term is a threat uh, that's sort of understated by just looking at what's happening today. So let's look at the p what potential for what could happen in the future. And let's start by just looking at the hazard without making statements of probability or risk. So if we look at the total hazard out there in land ice, um, so where, where are the different sources of ice on this planet and how much would they cause sea level ri to rise if they were melted um, and all, all their mass put in the ocean? So if we look at the mountain glaciers and ice caps, we've got about 25 centimeters of sea level rise, about 10 inches locked up there. Um, if you look at the sort of peripheral um, glaciers and ice caps around Greenland and Antarctica, we've got another half meter, about a foot and a half there. Um, and then you have the three major contribute potential hazards from sea level rise, the Greenland ice feet, which if it all melted would cause about seven meters of sea level rise, about 23 feet. The West Antarctic ice sheet, about five meters or 16 feet. And the East Antarctic ice sheet, about 52 meters or 170 feet. So those are just the ice there. We can assess uh, what's happening to these different ice reservoirs with a variety of techniques, one of the best of which in recent years um, involves <coughs> measuring the change in Earth's gravitational field that happens as you take these concentrated masses of ice, uh, masses of mass, um, the concentrated ma ice masses, and distribute their mass throughout the ocean. So my colleagues down at Princeton are one of a number of groups that do this sort of work. Um, this is their analysis of the last decade of the Greenland ice sheet on the left and the Antarctic ice sheet on the right. Uh, and so you can see, particularly the Greenland ice sheet, there appears to be an acceleration. The average rate of loss is about 240 billion tons of ice a year. And just to give you a sense of scale, 240 billion tons of ice a year, you spread that over the ocean, that amounts to about seven-tenths of a millimeter per year of sea level rise. So when we're talking about a mil just millimeters of sea level rise, these are immense masses of ice we're talking about. Antarctica, meanwhile, contributed about uh, 0.3 millimeters a year over the same time period. So that's the global picture. But nobody lives at the global mean. Everybody lives somewhere. And so when we think about the impacts of climate change, we have to understand how these sort of globally average changes translate to the local level. And when we look at local sea level rise, there are a whole bunch of additional factors that come into play. So in addition to density change, we have the fact that the water in the ocean um, can be shifted around by currents and by winds. Um, so we'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, you have the fact that when you melt ice and when you move large masses of ice around on the planet, you do things like change the Earth's gravitational field, which we can use to measure um, the, the amount of, of ice loss, but also causes a, a change in the shape of the Earth's gravitational field that's followed by the surface of the ocean and therefore causes uneven changes in sea level. Um, and we also have the fact that the land can move up and down as a result of a number of processes. So looking at those briefly in terms, so 
First, the dynamic effects. So this figure here is showing you the average height of the sea surface in the North Atlantic as measured by satellites from 1992 to 2002. Um, and the key thing you see here is this is the Gulf Stream, so the warm waters coming up from the Caribbean being carried towards Europe. And across the Gulf Stream, so basically um, sort of across Cape Hatteras, you have about, about a 60 centimeter, about a two uh, foot sea level rise um, gradient, or sea level gradient. So if you were to change the strength of the Gulf Stream, or where you were to change the position of the Gulf Stream, that would give you about two feet of additional sea level rise to play with. And if you look at how ocean models project changes in the response of the Gulf Stream and, and the overturning, Atlantic overturning circulation to warming, um, some of those would project for sort of the New York area as much as an additional um, 35 centimeters of sea level rise arising from changes in, in ocean dynamics. Then we get the mass effect. So again, I've already said, these are large masses of ice. So let's think about mass for a second. So here you've got a planet. Imagine it has an ocean, no ice on it. Uh, sorry. If we, should I do punchline? Um, if we put an ice cube on the planet, obviously not to scale or ice sheet, right, that ice mass is going to draw the, the gravitational field of the planet to it. So building that ice sheet, so taking water out of the ocean to build a mass actually causes a sea level rise near the ice sheet and a sea level fall from the extraction of the mass far from it. So conversely, if you were to melt that ice sheet, you get a sea level fall near the ice sheet and a sea level rise farther from it. So if we look at the effects of the Greenland and West Antarctica here, all of these dark blue areas are areas that experience a sea level fall in response to a shrinking ice sheet. So if you're in Scotland and the Greenland ice sheet loses mass, you experience a sea level fall. If you're in New York and the Greenland ice sheet experience, uh, shrinks, you experience about 40% of the sea level rise that you would if you were living at the global average. And if you live sort of down here in South America and the Greenland ice sheet think, shrinks, you experience about 20% more sea level rise than the global average. Conversely, if we look at the West Antarctic ice sheet, um, actually due to a bit more to effects that moving mass around has on the Earth's rotation, um, you get about 20% additional sea level rise off the coast of the US compared to the global average. So you know, if we think about that five meter hazard uh, from Ant West Antarctica for the global mean, that's about a six meter hazard um, here in the US. So finally, there's a bunch of other processes. You just mentioned one that's important for those of us on the coast of the US um, is the ongoing response of the land to the fact that there used to be a giant ice sheet sitting on, in North America north, from New York City north. Um, when you remove that mass, the Earth slowly responds and as a consequence of some of those changes, um, the areas around New York and New Jersey and the Mid-Atlantic is experiencing about uh, 1.3 millimeters per year of additional sea level rise. So that's that sort of um, red area here. So these are all the processes that we have to keep in mind as we look forward. We also have to keep these in mind as we look to the past and try to interpret records of the past that can help us inform our projections because, because of these processes, you know, the sea level, yes, not saying change, isn't measuring the same thing everywhere. So if you go and find a tide gauge record, which I'll show you of sort of historical changes, or you go and find a geological record of past changes, that's not measuring global average sea level, it's measuring sea level somewhere. And that change is related to the changes in ice sheets that we care about, but it's related through the filter of all these other processes. So if we look at the past context of uh, sea level change, I want to walk you through a number of different time scales and a number of different records. So in the historical period, the records we have come from tide gauges, which is basically pretty simple. You, you put a stick, you fix it into the ground, you have some part, something that floats, and you measure the height of the thing that floats. So up here in the upper left, that's a picture of the battery tie gauge at the southern tip of Manhattan. Uh, and down here on the bottom is a record uh, from the battery tie gauge of sea level over the last, uh, since 1920. Um, and you can see both, there's this long-term upward trend, and you can see these spikes, the, the, the extreme sea levels that are a result of um, storm surges. Uh, so, you can see, for instance, Hurricane Donna 
here in 1960. And this record, the figure ended before 2008, but you can see where Superstorm Standy would have been on this record. So we've got all of these records of local sea level change around the world. If we want to say something about thermal expansion or ice sheet response, we have to figure out how to get sort of a globally average signal out of all these local records. Uh, and this could be another talk. Um, for those of you who are statistically inclined, I'll just briefly say that there's a number of approaches that, that we use that are all essentially inspired by Bayesian analysis. And I can walk you through them with questions if you're interested. Here's the, the punchline of our analysis of tide gauges. Uh, so here we're looking at sea level, global mean sea level over time starting in 1900. Our group's analyses are these two curves here using our two different, um, similar but, but different um, Bayesian techniques. One is a Kalman smoother, the other is Gaussian process regression. Um, and then those other curves are um, two different uh, analyses by other groups that we, we would argue are, are somewhat less statistically robust. The result of our analysis is that from 1900 to 1990, um, so up until that point, global mean sea level rose at a rate of about 1.2 millimeters per year, or about half an inch per decade. And that over the last 20 years, there's been about a two and a half fold acceleration in the rate of sea level rise. That recent part, um, is in agreement among all these different techniques. It's really the, the amount that's been um, earlier in the 20th century that, that is a source of disagreement. So that's what we can see for the 20th century. Yes? Uh, that seems to be a bit of a change to me. I thought the IPCC estimated about 2 millimeters historical rate and, a, and an increase of about 1.2 millimeters. Is that, is that a change from what, what they had done? So, so the IPCC, the, the, the uh, Church and White's results here, this one and, a, one and a half millimeters per year is more or less where the IPCC numbers okay. were. Um, it may have been before the, I, I haven't gone back and, to remember what it said before the fifth assessment report. So the IPCC, for, for those of you who may not know, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's the UN panel that sort of periodically assesses the literature. David. Do you think the sea level rise in the very first part of that record is natural? Or um, let me give you some geological context. Uh, so, good question. Thank you for leading me to the next slide, which is, this is what we can observe. We might be able to push the record a little farther back because the earliest tide gauges um, in Northern Europe actually go back to the late 18th century. Uh, but the quality, the, the, the spread of the record, geographic scope of the record sort of shrinks in volume to the point where in the 19th century you're only looking at the Northern Hemisphere with very few exceptions. Um, but we can go back farther in time um, using geological proxies. And for the last 3,000 years, um, thanks to the work of, of groups like my colleague Ben Horton at Rutgers, there are actually quite good reconstructions of local sea level change um, that come from uh, proxies that uh, come from salt marshes. So here's a picture of a salt marsh in Newfoundland uh, where Ben's team uh, was collecting samples. Uh, I think this was last summer. Uh, and so just one example of the way um, sort of geologists think about this. So what they're going to go do, or what they've done, is stick a core into the sediment, pull out this core, and then as they go through the core, like look at the assemblages of different types of microfossils, uh, particular types of microfossils called um, foraminifera. And different assemblages of fossils um, are associated with different parts of the tidal zone. So you can actually construct a, a probability distribution that says this particular assemblage gives you a probability, you know, this likelihood of being here in the in the um, in the tidal zone. And so you can see this, and you can know where you are in the tidal zone. So if you then can get a some way of determining how old those particular fossils are, which you can do with a variety of techniques, including on these age scales, carbon-14 dating. Um, you can look at pollution horizons in more recent stuff um, and a number of other proxies. Uh, you can start to construct this sort of sea level, local sea level record that can give you sort of 10 centimeter or so resolution and sort of few decades scale temporally. So we can compile these sorts of records and other lower resolution records from around the world. Um, we can build a statistical model that separates out the contributions from local changes and global mean changes and pull out a global mean sea level curve. And so this uh, is our uh, 
currently in review, so subject to change, um, global sea level curve for the last 2,500 years. Uh, and we, sorry, we can see a number of uh, features here. So first of all, there has been variability over the common era. It's roughly plus or minus uh, 12 centimeters, or about plus or minus five inches. Uh, the most noticeable signal here is a decline in, uh, from around 800 years of common era to around 1400 common era, which turns out to be correlated with the decline in global mean temperature that's roughly 0.2 to 0.3 degrees Celsius, so roughly half a degree Fahrenheit. Uh, so we see that these, this historical variability, and we also see this increase in the 20th century that we saw also in the tide gauge record, um, and we can conclude with 95% probability that this increase was faster than any increase in the previous 26 centuries. So, some geological context. Yes? Oh, that slide you had earlier with the uh, proportion of sea level rise that's yep. due to thermal expansion and ice change, <clears throat> this variability, was that like thermal expansion or ice sheets? Or Good question. Um, so, we don't really know. Um, We've done some preliminary analysis using, say, these fingerprint effects that I, the, 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 I sh uh, showed you earlier. Um, and actually, Greenland, it seems like the Greenland ice sheet is actually not very in sync with global mean sea level. It's, it's very more in sync with European temperatures, which are doing something a little weird and a little delayed. Whoa, what did I do there? A uh, little weird and a little delayed um, relative to, to global temperature. Um, so, so those of you who have been to historical talks about the Little Ice Age, if you're talking about the European Little Ice Age, that's something that starts around 1400 CE. Um, and Greenland seems to vary with that. Uh, this magnitude of change could be due entirely to thermal expansion. Is probably, and my, my guess would be, is to, due to a uh, combination of thermal expansion and mountain glaciers. Uh, yeah? Just for the novices, at, at 700 and 1000, what happened there, and is that due to the change in the sun or something, or? Uh, so, so the little blips? Yeah, the, the blips that are bigger than today's blip, yeah. Uh, so the, this, is, this signal, or like this, these things? It's 700 years and 1,000 years. 700 years and 1,000 years. Um, so nothing, in, so, so like what you should be looking for is a relationship between rate of change and temperature, as opposed to absolute height, I would say, in this figure. Um, I would also not draw um, too much conclusion from absolute height simply because if you think we, we have this network of global sites, um, there's never going to be a way you could exclude the possibility that there's some constant linear trend that we're recording in all those sites that might be due to, say, tectonics or some other effect that's of the scale of like a tenth of a millimeter per year or less. And so you, know, you can rotate this curve. And so, so the rates, then the change in rates give you something that's more robust than, than, the, than the ice. Okay. So, oh, I lost my, um, sorry, uh, for whoever was paying attention to that. Um, so, this, we can step back. Well, that makes a big difference. Um, we can step back uh, one more scale in time um, and ask, okay, so this is what's happened over the last... 3,000 years. Um, what's happened in early other periods in Earth history? Um, periods when temperature might have been slightly higher than today. Uh, so this is an example of the sort of sea level indicators we have that can go back a little farther. Um, these are coral reefs. So coral reefs grow at certain um, depths with relationship to, this, to the height of the sea surface. Um, this is a particular, dominated by a particular species of reef known as Acropora palmata that lives with between about zero and five meters uh, below sea level. So when we find it about two meters above current sea level, that tells us that sea level at, that, at the time this formed must have been about two to seven meters um, higher than it is today. So this is an example from San Salvador in the Bahamas, which happens to have been, although this is not my, my photo, where um, I went on a field, one of my first geology field trips as an undergraduate here um, back in 2001. So last interglacial period of around 125,000 years ago. This is of interest because while it's hard, for the same reason that it's hard to reconstruct global mean sea level to say exactly what global mean temperature was doing during this time period, it seems to have been slightly warmer than today. 
So this is another group's um, reconstruction, um, but you find um, estimates of, uh, of land temperature about 1.7 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial, which would be about um, 0.9 degrees warmer than today. Um, and ocean temperatures um, and land ocean temperatures that are very slightly higher than today. So we can maybe use this as an indicator of the long-term response of sea level to roughly one to two degrees C of warming above um, pre-industrial levels are about uh, 0.2 to 1.2 degrees warming above today. So what was sea level during, during this time period? Um, we can, again, using Bayesian techniques, assemble a global database, try to pull out the global signal. Um, in this case, we have throw into the mix not just um, uh, not, not just uh, the records, but also the, the uh, physical model of those processes that I showed you earlier. Um, and these are, this is the curve that we come up with. This is time uh, going from 135,000 years ago to 110,000 years ago. Um, for those of you who are not geologists, geologists often plot time backwards on axes, so time is flowing from right to left. Um, and you notice a couple of things, but the thing I want to pull away from this figure is that it was very probably higher than today. In fact, with 95% probability, sea level during the last interglacial was at least 6.4 meters higher than today or 21 feet higher than today. Although it's unlikely, only about a 30% chance that it was more than about nine, feet or 30, nine meters or 30 feet higher than today. So that's you know, a significant response uh, to the last time temperatures were one to two degrees C warmer than pre-industrial. So what would that mean if we had six meters of sea level rise? This is an analysis uh, from Climate Central, just looking, at, this is a figure I mentioned earlier in the talk, looking at that population that's within six meters. Um, and you can see where it's distributed at the dis you know, large number, not surprisingly, in China, large number. Um, so this is, a, this is in the range of around 80 million. This is in the range of around 30 million in the US. And overall, you know, six meters of sea level rise would cause the loss of areas currently home to about 380 million people. But that's, again, largely a hazard statement. We, we can say we probably would be committed to that level of sea level rise with one to two degrees of global warming, but this in and of itself doesn't tell us whether that's something that emerges over centuries or millennia, um, or has a couple of people like Jim Hansen would argue considerably faster than that. So let's talk about how we might look at that problem, find, understand the, the risk of future sea level rise. What's the source of the wide length of time? Um, it's hard to tell time in the geological record, um, particularly on short time scales. So, this is a, so for this period in particular, this is a very active area of research and it's something that our group and our collaborators are, are working on. So there are new databases that might help resolve this better, but it's it's really hard to go back 125,000 years and identify something that you can clearly tie to sort of decadal scale changes. And do people use models or do they just use these terrible um, you, you predominantly are using, trying to look for data in the field. You probably wouldn't necessarily believe a model just based on, on this. Um, so there's some arguments that the, the you could, might have had, that these jumps might have had taken place on a couple of century time scales based on different interpretations of fossils, but it's nothing that I would regard as, as quantitative. Um, you know, I, I think we're, we're, we're do, we can probably do somewhat better than we've done so far, but um, <coughs> yeah. And then of course there's problem that this is this is um, a time period 125,000 years ago. The forcing was different, and you know there's only so much it can tell you, especially in a world that may be well above the two degrees C um, that this is this could be associated with. So, what about assessing future risk? How can this help us, and what else do we need to know? Uh, so. It would be lovely if you had a physical model that captured all of the physics of the ice sheets very well and could predict what was happening. Um, but fundamentally, that's very difficult because a lot of the behavior of ice sheets depend, the macro scale behavior depends upon a lot of physics that happen at a relatively small scale. And so, you know, if you can't get the small scale physics right, you may be maybe screwing up the large scale projection. So, um, I was talking with Doug McHale uh, over, uh, I don't, know if Doug's here, but Doug McHale over, oh yeah, hi Doug, um, knows a whole lot more about this than, than I do. Um, but just one example of this that, I, that I, I like to show, right? So 
This was the Larsen B ice shelf in January 2002. Now, ice shelf is floating ice, so if it melts, it doesn't contribute to global mean sea level, but it has a buttressing effect on the adjacent ice sheet. So if the ice shelf were to say suddenly disappear, um, you know, that could have a significant amount of uh, effect on the flow of the ice sheet into the ocean. Um, so if we just look over the course of February 2002, um, and notice this is a, a 40 kilometer scale bar down here, right? We went middle of February, later in February, and by early March, right, that entire 40 kilometer ice shelf did disappear. So if this is playing an important role in the physics and you don't have a model because you know, maybe Doug hasn't solved the problem yet that can, can predict this, then you're going to have problems when you go up to a higher scale. So this is an area that's very active research. Um, there's a long list of interesting topics under research by the community, um, starting with one that you may have heard about, this marine ice sheet instability. So if you, you can actually get this sort of positive a vicious cycle um, where you, know, sort of you have uh, the bed underneath the ice sheet sloped in such a way so that as, you, as warm waters eat away at the ice sheet, it exposes a larger area to be eaten away at. And so you get this sort of positive feedback loop. Um, uh, and there's been some evidence um, from Eric Rigno's group that this process may have started already in parts of, of West Antarctica, um, but the time scale it would take to completion is still something we don't really know. Um, another interesting example, um, you know, if you look at a lot of ice sheet models for Antarctica, they would predict something on the order of, say, 10 centimeters of contribution to sea level over the 21st century. Um, but Rob DeConta's group at Amherst discovered that if you put into one of these models um, some of you know, the, the fact that you know, if you develop cliffs uh, where, the, where you have this intersection, um, with the ice sheet and they become unstable, suddenly instead of 20 centimeters, you can get a meter, right? So you get, the point to take away from that is not the number, it's that there's first order physics that have yet to be incorporated into these models. And the key point for our talk is that that means we need to look somewhere else to get our sea level rise projections. So one approach people have used is what those of you in the booth school might think about as an econometric approach, right? So you've got a sea level curve, which I showed you. Um, we have a couple of reconstructions of temperature um, down here. And so can we find a statistical model that relates uh, the sea level to temperature? This is called a semi-empirical model in the sea level community, and you can build one. And we've built one. Um, and uh, what we find um, is that if we build a statistical model, uh, then I can get into those assumptions that underlie that if people want, um, we find that under a high emission scenario, um, we would project a, like, a very likely increase of about 20 inches to 48 inches over the course of the 21st century, um, and in a very low emission scenario, 10 to 24 inches. Um, so at this point, I just want to pause and introduce a little bit of community for, of, of terminology for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So we're talking about RCP. Those are representative concentration pathways. So these are sort of standardized scenarios that the climate modeling and integrated assessment modeling community have developed um, to feed into climate models. So RCP 8.5, you can think of that as sort of continued fossil fuel intensive growth, leading to carbon dioxide concentrations around 900. 40 parts per million by the end of the century. And RCP 2.6 is a very low emissions one in which carbon dioxide emissions are brought to zero around 2080, and peak carbon dioxide concentrations peak around 440 parts per million. Okay, so let's keep these two numbers in mind. And what are we getting one or two parts per million per year right now? Uh, yeah, about two parts per million. So four, and we're at 400, so it's 20 more years? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so there's a pathway that's, uh, so well, cumulative emissions are really what matters. But yes, yeah, so you know, it would require a great deal of effort starting with lowering emissions right away. And actually, even if we bring emissions to 2080, to zero in 2080, um, it, this actually involves bringing emissions below zero after 2080. So, yeah. But the dread is increasing over time, right? So it's not, is it, is it actually going to be 20 more years till we hit 440, or is it sooner? Uh, that depends upon the rate at which emissions increase over time. Uh, so, you know, I mean, actually, you know, if, if, if countries actually follow through on their pledges um, that they've made, that, that 
lowers the slope of that rate of increase significantly. It doesn't really bring the number down, but it does bring it close to plateauing um, the rate of level of emissions, not the level, not this concentration. So that's a semi-empirical model, but it doesn't quite get us what we want because semi-empirical models project global mean changes, um, and moreover, uh, there may be a significant out-of-sample problem, right? We're calibrating a model <laughs> against the time period where we were talking about two, ten two tenths or three tenths of a degree C change in temperature, uh, in which thermal expansion meant mountain glaciers are probably the dominant contr contributors to the sea level change, and you're using it to extrapolate to a period where ice sheets are going to become a growing part of the problem, and you're talking about something more like two to five degrees C temperature change. So what's the alternative approach? Well, if we can't rely on physical models and the statistical models have these limitations, um, the best we can do is sort of look out at the different lines of information that are, are there and figure out how we can synthesize them. So we did this in a, a paper, uh, I guess, came out last year. This, this was the source of the sea level rise projections that have informed some of the economic risk modeling um, that we've done and that Amir was involved in. Um, and so this flow chart is sort of summarizing the five major contributors to sea level change we have to worry about. So land water storage, the ice sheets, the glaciers, thermal expansions, and locally ocean dynamics, and locally sort of non-climatic geological processes like glacial ice static adjustment or tectonics. Um, so for each of these, we have a different thread of, of knowledge we can draw upon. So, can you talk about expert elicitation and expert? Yes, uh, I will talk about it a little bit because Michael Oppenheimer is going to, I think, talk about it a lot in two weeks. Um, but let me talk about the others first. So land water storage, you can sort of develop statistical models that relate historical demand for either uh, groundwater or for um, dam construction to population and that can inform that number. Uh, Non-climatic background processes, you simply look at what's happened historically. Glacial isostatic adjustments or tectonics aren't going to be influenced uh, by the climate changes going on now, so those just continue. Um, and then the climate models here, so these are the sort of big uh, general circulation models, global climate, mo global climate models that have been developed through efforts of the, of the climate science community over the last since the late 1960s. Um, and the climate models directly produce projections of thermal expansion and the changes in ocean circulation and, and atmospheric circulation that give rise to ocean dynamics. So we can construct a probability distribution um, sort of based on those results. Uh, the climate models also give you temperature and precipitation. And if you combine those with models of sort of how snowfall and melting govern um, the, the changes in mass of glaciers, you can model the mountain glaciers reasonably well. And then we have the ice sheets. Uh, so yeah. So can I just ask, um, uh, the, the coupling between ice sheets and ocean dynamics, I would have thought yeah. that changes in the salinity of the planet might well affect those of Yeah, so, so, that, so that's is fair. There feedback or not? There's a, yeah, there is, a, there is a potential feedback not captured in these projections. Um, and this, was, this is tricky because the only way to do that is actually to do new runs of a large-scale global climate model. Once you're talking about that, you're talking about a lot of computation. Here we're drawing upon the many runs that have always, always, already been done through things like the coupled model and a comparison project. Um, so there are papers that are looking at this relationship. Um, uh, we've actually done a, did a paper a few years ago that sort of looked at this very sort of illustratively, and there have been more papers that have looked at it more realistically. And so it does have an effect. Um, that's not going to be in our projections. So expert assessment, here we're talking about basically the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's work. So they, they look at the literature and they try to come up with their assessment based on the literature. So there's not that much to say about that, except um, that when it comes to sea level, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change only offers what they call likely projections. So a likely is a particular term in IPCC language. It means there's a 67% probability this will be the case, which means that there is a um, 17 percent chance that it will be higher than the top end of the likely range and if you want to use the IPCC numbers for risk assessment uh, you're sort of uh, left with nothing to draw upon if you care about something that has a probability of less than 17 percent. 
Um, so the other source of information we can draw on is expert elicitation. And this is a formal sort of social scientific process where you gather a bunch of experts, you ask them calibration questions, so you're not just doing a survey, you're trying to calibrate how well they know what they're talking, they're talking about. And then you have, there are various different aggregation techniques for using those calibration questions and answers to questions to constructing probability distributions of a parameter. So Michael Oppenheimer is going to talk about that, I think, a fair bit when his talk in two weeks. Um, this was not our expert elicitation we drew upon. This was one done by Bamber and Aspinall. Uh, and they're sort of looking at contributions of sea level rise um, from ice sheets over the 21st century. So we took the IPCC's assessment of the likely range and sort of fused that with information about the overall tail risk that came from this expert elicitation. And then for both ice sheets and glaciers, we have a little physical model that takes into account those gravitational and elastic rotational effects we talked about. So looking at this first in the global mean, um, here are some figures. These are showing you three different concentration pathways. Um, the national, independent nationally determined contributions, the country, national pledges, um, don't quite get you down to RCP 4.5. So they put you somewhere between RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5. Um, so this is showing you projections over time with various air bars. Um, this is easier to read. So the likely range, um, which is pretty close to the IPCC's numbers by, by construction, um, under the high emission scenarios, about two feet to three and a half feet, um, and in a really low emission scenario, you gain a little less than a foot, so um, about one foot to a little over a little over one foot to a little over two foot, two feet. But there's a significant tail risk that's driven by the uncertainty in the Antarctic ice response. This is show, this figure is showing you the contribution of different. Um, sources to the uncertainty in the overall sea level rise projection. You can see initially it's uncertainty in the behavior of the ocean, but by the end of the century, uh, the Antarctic ice sheet comes to dominate the source of uncertainty. Um, and so, you know, we get about a one in 200 chance that you could have as much as 70 inches of sea level rise um, in the global mean uh, by the end of the century under high emissions. Uh, now, interestingly, if you compare those bottom-up results to the ones I showed you from the semi-empirical model, these, which were completely independently derived, uh, match almost exactly. Um, and this is an interesting result for sort of the, from the scientific side because for a long time, semi-empirical projections had been higher than this and bottom-up projections had been lower than this, and so we've converged. Is that a good thing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it gives you confidence in both of the answers, or maybe it makes you worry that both of these are skewed by historical experience. Um, so anyway, it's, it's interesting that these two independent methods have, have, have converged. Uh, so, uh, local sea level rise projections, as we've already hit upon, vary significantly from this. If you look at the global picture, you see, like, you know, this is one of many cases where people at high latitude tend to be more or less exposed than people at low latitude. Um, so you have limited sea level rise when you're near in that sort of near the gravitational effects of the ice sheet. Um, this notable exception on the east coast of the U.S. is associated with the effects of ocean dynamics that we talked about. And then there's whole, a whole bunch of spots in the world, like the western Gulf of Mexico, like Bangladesh, like the Manila area, where you have things like groundwater or hydrocarbon withdrawal that are giving you really rapid rates of sea level change. And then you have places like Japan, where you've got a lot of stuff going on because of tectonics. If we just compare uh, globally in New York, um, you know, the, the high end, there's about additional 10 to uh, 15 inches of sea level rise potential um, in New York. We're going to spend every single dollar to protect Manhattan. Yeah. So uh, Michael is going to tell us in two weeks how much it takes to protect 26 to 50? Um, I hope so. I'll give you a number from Vancouver uh, just as a benchmark, um, but we haven't looked at that in, in too much detail yet. Um, and if we you know, say we also get this sort of foot to foot and a half reduction uh, in both local and global numbers, if we go from all the way from the fossil fuel intensive path to the zero emissions in 2080 path. So what does that mean for coastal flood risk? 
Well, so there's two things that happen in sea level rise. First of all, there, there are areas that get permanently flooded, but then for most of the world, the more significant effect is that it means it takes a smaller storm surge or even smaller tidal range to cause flooding from extreme water levels. And we care about this, um, particularly in New Jersey the last three years because of our experience with Superstorm Sandy. Um, this is just one picture that, this is a flyover of Ship Bottom. Uh, my colleague Ken Miller did a few years ago for a class. Uh, this is the same pier as it appeared on the Philadelphia Inquirer um, you know, shortly after Sandy. Um, you know, having an event like that sort of focuses people's attention. In fact, there's some social scientific discussion of, of events like these has focusing events that have the potential to cause policy change. Um, in New York State, in New York City, arguably this has caused some policy change. In New Jersey, it, it arguably has not. Um, so if we think about what's exposed here. So if we look uh, at the New York metro area with nine feet of sea level rise, which is roughly the storm surge of Superstorm Sandy, or the storm surge of a flood that has about a 10% annual probability when you add on five feet of sea level rise. Um, you get this area. Um, I flew out of here yesterday. Um, it would be underwater with this amount of, of, of flooding. But in New York City itself, you've got about $170 billion of property, um, which is why Michael says we'll spend anything to protect it. Um, we've got about a million people, a third of whom are high social vulnerability. You've got about 400,000 homes, a uh, whole bunch of fire stations, EMS stations, and hospitals. So this is sort of what's threatened. So there's a, a a simple thing we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about extreme events, which is with any probability distribution that comes out of the exponential family, like a normal distribution, um, a change in the mean uh, can have a near exponential relationship with a change in number of extremes. So if we look at a normal distribution, right, we got a probability of a four sigma event is 0.003%. If we shift the mean by one sigma, that goes up to a tenth of a percent. If we shift the mean by two sigma, that goes up to 2%. Right? So we've got these sort of large scale effects. So we analyze um, these sorts of effects with flood extremes um, using extreme value statistics. So this curve here is showing you a number of things. So on the y-axis, this is the expected number of floods per year. So 0.1 means we have a 10% average annual probability flood, what would be colloquially called a 1 in 10 year event. Uh, 0.01 would be the colloquial 1 in 100 year event. This would be a 1 in 1,000 year event. Um, and then if you fit a parametric distribution uh, to the actual um, extremes, of, uh, uh, that are observed from the tie gauge record. And in this case, we're using a generalized Pareto distribution um, and a peak over threshold approach. Uh, you get a curve that looks something like this. So this is from 94 years of observations at, the, at um, the battery. And we've labeled the nine, or we identified the nine highest flood events on here. So Superstorm Sandy's out here with about 2.7 meters of storm surge. That was a hybrid of a nor'easter and a tropical storm. Um, Hurricane Donna was number two. Then the December 92 nor'easter here, about a one in uh, a 30 year event. Um, we've got a bunch of, hurricane, of hurricanes and nor'easters. Um, here's Hurricane Gloria, no, number nine. So one important thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of literature focused on potential changes in the distribution of tropical cyclones or hurricanes. Um, which could change the shape of this curve. Um, there's just been less work on the effects on extratropical cyclones or nor'easters. But in the US Northeast, both of these are significant contributors to flood risk. So if we think, for, hold, hold for the moment the thought that there might be changes in the hurricanes themselves. Let's keep those constant. And then ask, what is the effect of an increase in sea level? Right? So if we shift sea level by half a meter, Right. Notice that we have, again, this sort of log scale on the y-axis. So we've got this sort of that, that relationship where I said earlier, where the shift in the mean can cause an exponential increase in the number of extremes. So the new one in 10 year event has increased, is, has increased by, probability in, by probability sixfold. So it's what used to be the one in 60 year event um, down here. So around one and a half meters. 
if we go to shift it to the right by one meter, you know, the new one in 10 year event used to be the one in 220 year event. If we go up by one and a half meters, it used to be the one in 640 year event. And if we go up by two meters, it used to be the one in 1500 year event. Right? So we've getting this, this quite significant increase in risk from the shift in distribution. So second point to take away from this, again, right, notice the, exp the, the log scale. So if you, average, if you take the expectation of two curves together, let's say we think there is a 50% chance that there will be half a meter of sea level rise and a 50% chance that there'll be 1.5 meters of sea level rise. Your expected curve is not going to lie in the middle. It's going to lie over here, much closer to the one and a half meter curve. So if we think there's a 50% chance of half a meter and 50% chance of one and a half meters, um, we get about a 45 fold increase uh, to for the new one in 10 year event. So this is an important phenomena of uncertainty in uh, many cases dealing with extremes uh, that the tail, the, the, high, uh, a small, the, small, the high end tail of possible outcomes exerts a pull on your expectation about what's gonna happen with the extremes. So we can define um, and this is work our, my grad student Maya Buchanan has done, we can define um, something called a sea level rise allowance, which is basically saying how much margin do you need to build in, let's say how high or seawall do you need to build or, or whatever uh, measure do you want to take to protect your property or your investment if you want to keep your current level of flood risk. So let's say you currently accept, find acceptable um, to have a one in 10 year, a one in a 10% annual probability of flooding, more likely um, in the US we typically use like a one in 100 year probability for flood insurance, but it doesn't change too much, um, right? So sea level rise allowance is gonna tell you how much you would shift, uh, that you shift the distribution to maintain your constant risk of flooding. Uh, so in this case, we're going from around one meter to around 2.2 meters, so you would have about 1.2 meter allowance. Yeah? Is that number just equal to the mean increase in sea level? No, yeah. it's not. Um, and I took out the slide that would show you that, although if we, I can put it back in in questions. Um, no, it's importantly not, and it's importantly not because of this log scale over here. Right, because, well, we can, no, we can see it just here, right? What is the mean increase in sea level under this, under this scenario, right? It's one meter, right? This is a one meter curve, right? So you've got the pull of the tail caused by this log linear relationship. So when we think about how much we want to allow for sea level rise, there's a bunch of factors that go into account. So one is the acceptable risk of flooding. Um, how much that matters for your allowance um, depends upon the shape of this curve. Um, it's not actually a huge factor. Um, but what is a huge factor is your time frame, right? Do you care instantaneously allowed allowance? That is, you want your risk in 2050 to be the same as it is today. You might want that if, say, you're thinking about something, a project, and it's something that you think might go on indefinitely, so you don't have a fixed time horizon for it. Or is it a project where, as I say, you're building a house and you expect it to be there for 30 years, or you're building a bridge and you expect it to be there for 80 years, and you want to have over the lifetime of that bridge or that house a 1% average probability of flooding, right? So we can define these as sort of a metric that's integrated over the lifetime of your decision. One question you might ask is, well, what is the relevant time frame? And I think one thing, particularly if you're thinking at a planning scale, is that the relevant time frame is probably longer than you think it is. Uh, so one anecdotal example of this, um, the Marion Power Station in Jersey City, New Jersey, shown here. This was built by the Public Service Electric Company in 1905. This was Edison's company. Um, it was retired as a generating station in 1961. It was seceded by a new generating station, the Hudson Generating Station. Uh, this is that site in 1911, and this is it in 2012, right? So what happened, and I think this is something that you probably see in a lot of different cases, is that you have a system where you have sort of a, you, you have sunk cost, your network, you have a grid that's built up around these investments. And the topology of that grid um, has proven to be very durable. On this map here, 
these black dots, which you can probably vaguely see, are, sta are we're generating stations. On this map here, the red stars are switching stations that were flooded during Superstorm Sandy. Right? So this map from 1911 shows you the locations of more than half of the switching stations that flooded during Superstorm Sandy and were responsible for much of the state being without power for a week or two weeks. Right? So Edison, back in 1900, was locking in decisions that affected the vulnerability of the state in 2011. Right, so, so something to think about in terms of time frame. So another complication, uh, what we might call deep uncertainty. So this is our probability distribution for sea level rise at the battery over time. So this is our median projection. Uh, these are the 67%, 95%, and 99% probability intervals around it. And this is, I, I, I told you how we generated this. This is one I would... I think I consider, perhaps self-flatteringly, thoughtfully produced self-consistent probability distribution, drawing upon the best available knowledge. But it's certainly not the only justifiable probability distribution. So this is a, a, a situation where we have multiple possible probability distributions that, can that could serve as inputs to our distribution. And so there's a literature, um, there's a, the robust decision making under uncertainty, and there's a, a center here um, that relates to that, um, that deals, that provides some techniques for dealing with deep uncertainty. One approach that fits in well to our framework um, involves something called a limited degree of confidence metric, which basically says, well, how confident are you in your PDF you present? And let's say we're, called, we say we're 95 percent confident. Well, let us say, well, there's a 5 percent chance that it's going to be the worst case scenario. So we get a, a parameter that allows us to tune our confidence in our expert PDF with sort of the worst case capturing the, you know, throw up our hands, we don't know what to do, part of the distribution. Uh, so we can incorporate that into our allowances. Um, these plots, which I think are probably too complicated for me to have thrown up here, um, are showing you the instantaneous allowance over time uh, for different levels of confidence. So this beta of one means you have complete confidence in the work we've done, thank you. And a beta equals zero means you think we have no idea what we're doing uh, and the world is, may, may end in, in 2100. Um, and we've got various parameters in between. Um, this is showing you the same for projects that start in 2020 and have different end dates. This is more useful, this table, right? So if we have complete confidence in what we are doing, you say if you want your flood risk to stay constant in 2100, you need to put in a 57-inch margin in your project. Um, if you want it to stay constant at, say, 1%, um, per year over 2020 to 2100, then you need to put in a two-foot margin. But if you have only 90% confidence in what we do, you know, this number goes from 57 inches to 92 inches and 24 inches to 36 inches. And if you have only 67% confidence, it goes, from, uh, goes up to 104 inches and 43 inches. So one thing you'll notice is it doesn't take much reduction in confidence to pull that number higher, right? It's that same pull of the tail that I, I was talking to you earlier about you talking to you about earlier. So you know, the, the number, if you have only 67% confidence in what we do, you know, you're closer to what you would do if you only thought about the worst case scenario than if you thought about our PDF. So this is another parameter, and I would argue, you probably, you, I would think that our, our results merit more than 67% confidence, but not 100% confidence. And so this is, you know, if you're a decision maker, you just want to keep this in mind as sort of your tolerance. So another potential change is we've been talking about sea level rise and changes in flood risk that result from taking the current storms and, and shifting the base level. Um, there is some reason to think uh, that you're going to see potential changes in the distribution of tropical cyclones as well because by heating up the oceans, um, and in particular if you increase temperature gradients in the ocean, you provide more energy for tropical cyclones. Uh, this figure here on the left is a uh, work by Kerry Emanuel at MIT, who's run a, a model downscaling climate model projections um, and looking at the change in the annual global frequency of tropical cyclones over time in this high emission scenario. And he gets, you know, sort of the median projection is about a 25% a increase over the course of the century. Um, 
And if we look at the change in distribution from his results of the wind speed of landfalling US hurricanes, we get this little picture here. So we see both an uh, uh, increase at all speeds, but particularly an increase in, in the high speeds. Um, we, are working, we haven't incorporated this into the allowance framework, but we're working to do that. What we have incorporated it into is what I'm going to talk about in the next part, which is what the costs of this might be. Um, and this is work that's in our book that you can buy or you can largely read online for free, um, that, uh, which um, Amir is a, a co-author on. So uh, first of all, I mentioned one of the costs of climate change is just permanent inundation. Uh, so if we look at a property database of the US and say, you know, given different levels of sea level rise, how much property flows um, falls below the mean high tide line. Um, you know, you get numbers on the order of $200 billion of property, current property that falls below the high tide line by 2030, you know, increasing up to as much as, uh, you know, $800 billion. Um, so that's U.S. only? This is U.S. only, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I don't have a sense about how expensive, and I understand Michael's going to talk about a little bit, but this is a no adaptation. This is not, so this is simply the current property and you're raising the sea level. Yeah. Uh, is, yeah. Do you have any sense like is adaptation expensive? Or? Right, and we'll, we'll, get to, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> I want to know how much you're going to spend if right. can, will. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that very briefly, but, but I do have a slide because you asked for it. Um, so so this, is, this is the property that falls below the mean high tide line. To look at the changes in um, losses from storms, we partnered with Risk Management Solutions, which is a company that advises insurance companies, and we use their North Atlantic hurricane model um, and basically incremented sea level and, in some cases, changed the distribution of storms. Um, and so they basically have a model that has 30,000 tropical cyclones in it that, that, um, that, that uh, impact the U.S. Uh, and they model the hydrodynamics of what happens when these storms come on land, and they model the business interruption costs as well as the property damage. Um, and so we'll get the results I'll show you in a second. So uh, first thing we say is that, that the common, both sea level rise and change, potential changes in storm expand the flood plain, it should say. So this is looking at the change at the 1% average annual probability flood plain over time in New York City. Um, and so the area in dark blue is the current 100-year floodplain, um, and these areas that are yellow are ones that are in the floodplain by 2030, so bits of Manhattan, um, I, Red, Red Hook maybe, I don't know. Um, and then you know, a whole bunch of area around Jamaica Bay and, J and JFK Airport. Um, and over here on the right is with the changes in the storm. It turns out, in this case, it doesn't make that much of a difference, except that Newark Airport is in the 100-year floodplain uh, by 2100. Um, so if we run that model, we get uh, sort of increased average annual coastal storm damage. Again, no adaptation. Again, current property distributions. This is the average level today nationally in the US of $27 billion a year. Um, this is the increase over time, only accounting for the effect of sea level rise. So basically, you know, under a high emission scenario, you're talking about a doubling or maybe as much as a tripling. So you know, if you're really unlikely, the one in 100 chance, 99th percentile, you know, maybe as much as $75 billion a year if you didn't adapt um, to these changes. Yeah. Could I just ask about oh, abandoning property that falls below yeah. the sea level? I mean, if you're anywhere close to there, you would trouble. Um, is that the right metric to use? Well, so there, so, so what this is, uh, well, so you could, you could change the abandonment threshold. There are parts, the reason why that matters is because there are parts of the U.S. where we live that are below mean sea level today, like in lots of, a bunch of Louisiana. So, so it's, it's, a ra it's not a huge factor in these calculations, but it's an important one when you think of it in the context of those, the, the first chart I, I showed. So, so, so the stuff, yeah, the, the stuff. Be a very large factor that there's a lot of land, uh, real estate between mean sea level and between one bad storm every three years or something. So, 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 so the the main reason why that's of note is that the stuff that we're showing here has fallen below 
mean high tide level, you don't just keep damaging it every year. You're not inflating your storm damages by doing that. As with so many things, this is an unevenly distributed impact with the U.S. Mid-Atlantic sort of suffering the greatest percentage increase in damages. Um, this is 2050, um, and we see in New Jersey sort of a median projection of about a doubling of average annual storm damage. These changes, as in everything, are driven by changes in the extremes, right? So if we look now another return period figure, this is the expected number of events, except now we're looking at billions of dollars instead of, um, instead of, of height. Um, this is New York City. This is Superstorm Sandy was around $18 billion to New York City alone. Um, and if we look at the probability, you know, so 50 centimeters of sea level rise gives you about a 50% increase in the probability of a Superstorm Stanley event. A meter gives you about a doubling. Uh, a meter and a half gives you about a five-fold increase, and a two meters gives you about a ten-fold increase in the probability of a Superstorm Stanley scale damage event. Um, we can also look at what the effects of changes in storm intensity are, and we can see that that's of comparable scale. So factoring in some of these projected changes in, in storms gives you about a, a, a doubling to maybe as much of a tripling by the end of the century of, of that damage just from the increase in sea level rise. So what do we do? So we can do an illustrative experiment to say, let's suppose we build a magical protection that excludes all storms where the surge doesn't rise above a certain height. Um, so this is the experiment we've done here. Uh, um, importantly, in this model, the, the model already assumes that there's some protection existing today. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the protection height, and then this is the expected additional losses per year relative to no sea level rise and no additional protection. Right, and so the different curves are looking at the average annual damage integrated over 2020 to 2030 and 2020 to 2040 and so forth up to 2020 to 2100. So how much, you know, if you wanted to keep your level of damages uh, today um, constant, or level of damages, average annual damages constant, how much protection do you need to build? So if you care to 2030, you would need to build to about 2.8 meters, um, and that's above a current level of about 2 meters. And this is New York State. It's going to be pretty similar for New York City. Um, we just did the analysis at a state level. If you care to 2100, you would need to build to about 4.5 meters or about 2.5 um, meters above the current protection level. Now, how much does that cost? Uh, my uh, Rachel Desculio, who's an undergraduate working with me, just pulled this out as a reference point, um, has a well-documented example. So Van Metro Vancouver has been thinking about protection. Um, they have a defense strategy that's focused on shoring up current defenses and building new flood defenses, and they're going towards a one meter protection level. So they're protecting about 2.3 million people, and they estimate a cost of about $10 billion. So this is your reference point. Let's say, assuming it scales with population, let's call that $50 billion per meter in New York City. So maybe this 2.5 meters projection, I would roughly guesstimate something in the range of $120, $150 billion. That Order, very crude order of magnitude, something we're looking at more. Doesn't it depend more on the geography? Yes, it does. Uh, yeah, so I just don't have in my, I don't have in my mind what the square kilometer is of, of New York City, so you can, that's why I did it by population. Is that there are two pinch points. Yes. No, right, no, it may well be cheaper, but, but just to give you a scale, so you're talking about tens of billions, projects in the order of tens of billions of dollars. I think that's a fair, fair point to, to draw. Um, so, just to conclude with some very light speculation, what do we, you know, what do we do about this? Well, one option we have is to rebuild unchanged and assume uh, the rest of the country will continue to subsidize indefinitely the flood losses. This is more or less the approach that's been taken in New Jersey. Um, another approach is uh, to harden structures. So this is an example of a barrier. Um, the, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Dutch, but it's a, the, in, in the Netherlands, right? So it's a flood barrier, sort of like the Thames barrier. So we can build hard structures. This is another approach taken in New Jersey, right? We can try to adjust our architecture so that it's a bit more resilient. So 
you know, raise, um, you know, rather than trying to protect the whole community to the additional two and a half meters, raise your buildings two and a half meters. So you see that some in Florida, you're starting to see it more on the Jersey Shore. Um, and may have to make some additional modifications to our communities to be resilient to occasional flooding. And the other option, rather than raising the building, is to raise the buildings with a Z and retreat from the shore. So allow salt marshes, for example, to come in and build a soft buffer um, to these options. So these are options where you know, we've, we're doing, starting to do some research on here, but I don't have any particular insights to share at the moment. Um, Final thought is that we've got to think about how we decide from them. So, you know, I work with economists a lot, so I, I am slightly biased towards thinking about things sort of technocratically. You know, how do we incorporate benefit cost analysis into thoughtful land use decisions? But that's not the only way to think about the problem. Um, we can also, still thinking in the economic frame, think about how we might change the market tools. Um, you know, we, we tried briefly in the U.S. to make national flood insurance closer to market rate, um, and that led to some areas experiencing sort of a tenfold increase in their, their, their flood insurance bills and a large political backlash, so we've retreated from that. Um, and then the third option is democratically. Um, one of the things at Rutgers is that we have a, a lot of people in, in urban planning, and some of those have been people have been working with communities along the Jersey Shore, helping them think through where to go when they see projections like these, right, and deliberate through that process. So that's another option, one focused a little less on sort of the technocratic benefit cost and more on, you know, how much people are, are willing to pay. Um, uh, well, so, I mean, I think some of the communities have chosen. Some of the communities have chosen to 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 um, change what. Yeah, ability. So, so Ruck, So, our urban planning school. I just to give a little advertisement. Um, you know, when the community when they have communities that come to work with us and work with, say, a studio workshop. So, you probably have something similar in the Harris School in public policy. Um, you know, they actually do end up often using the results of, the, of, of these uh, analyses. Um, I would just say that we probably have to do all three and inform by risk assessments that reflect our best available knowledge. Um, despite the efforts of some states, the one thing we can't really do is just legislate sea level rise away. <laughs> oh, thanks. So to, to, to your knowledge, uh, you think that flood insurance, current flood insurance are not do not reflect what you... No, flood insurance is nowhere near market rate. I mean, the reason why the National Flood Insurance Program exists is because market-based you know, market insurers aren't willing to, to insure the area, you know, the, the, a lot of these shore areas. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. That was fantastic, Bob. Uh, Well, I have an opinion, not a question. But uh, if we want to do a democratic process to community process and all that, we should probably close the Congress and sit them all in the coastal lines, <laughs> and, uh, let them drown when the war comes, and then we will find our own ways to solve this problem. Because counting on these uh, institutions that have uh, try to give them enough uh, road to hang themselves, uh, it's not going to work. So, so I just, I'm not going to respond directly to your opinion. Um, ju just, to, just to say, um, you know, in you know, one of the issues, and this is even more extreme in a state like New Jersey, where we have home rule, these decisions often are not federal issues. Decisions about flood insurance are, are, are certainly federal. Um, but in New Jersey, we have 180 coastal communities, each of which coastal municipalities, each of which have their own land use policy. Um, we don't have very much leadership from the state, which could provide some, some common ground. So you've sort of got 180 different chances to experiment uh, with this in a disorganized fashion. Um, so in this case, it really, you know, the, the, the governing tools or land use tools largely are at a, a sub-federal, well, are completely at a sub-federal level and often at a sub-state level. Yeah. I have a question I don't really know how to formulate it, but the results of, of flooding uh, are not sort of continuous. There can be some very bad cases. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually live on a harbor with a, a dunes that keeps us from the sea. It doesn't take much to overwhelm the dunes, and then everything changes. 
it's it's sort of catastrophic rather than yeah. continuous. To what extent are the effects uh, and the costs? Uh, and similarly, in New York City, I can imagine one storm that overcomes a barrier floods all the subways, all the basements, and the electrical outfits of buildings. And so this is an outlier on the tale of cost and effect and such. How does that get factored? Yeah, so, so this is a phenomenon that arises a lot when we have, we think about extreme value problems. If you have a fat tail, as you often have in the case of the storms, um, you don't even, you, you know, they, you're, you're, if it's sufficiently fat, it doesn't even make sense to provide averages because they become unstable. And so it is just the most recent storm that drives the damages. So that's actually arguably the case with the flood insurance program, which was roughly in balance until Katrina and then has been totally out of, out of fiscal balance since Katrina because its entire budget sheet is dominated by Katrina and Sandy. So, so that's absolute, absolutely a crazy. Um, Roger Cook at, at Resources for the Future has been doing some work looking at the, um, with Carol and Kuski looking at sort of the fatness of the tail of damages. And they actually find some evidence that that fatness is increasing, maybe with some contribution from sea level rise or climate change, but also with the increasing concentration of the population in high vulnerability areas. I just want to add that it's often those events that govern policy which then govern yeah, costs. Ab absolutely. And that's why you know, Sandy has, a, in, the, in our region, served as sort of a focusing event for thinking about this and this. I already led to some policy change in New York City and New York State, if not in New Jersey. Yeah. Following up on that earlier question a little bit, Washington, D.C. is in the sea level tidal zone. Yeah. What, are the, what are the projections for Washington? Um, so, a good question. I, I actually, in other talks, I have a, a map uh, of that. Um, you know, the, the mall floods, um, you know, it doesn't take much to flood the mall. That, that floods during inland storms now. Um, you know, there's a fair bit of topography. Uh, so, you know, the, the Capitol Hill is not going to flood, right? It's a hill. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, so it, it um, you know, so, so it's, a, it's, there's a flood zone there, but it's large, you know, it, a lot of it is concentrating around the mall. It's also a pretty complicated modeling problem with kind of a weird extreme value distribution because it's pretty far from the ocean. It's just up the Potomac. And so you've got the combination of, of sort of tidal flooding and um, storm driven flooding coming in from the coast and also inland flooding driven by precipitation. Storm surge come up the Oh yeah, yes, it absolutely can. It, it's just that the, it's a, it's it's a it's a non-trivial problem because you've got multiple directions you can get flooded from. Yeah. So I think the lesson I would take away from your talk is that storms are coming. It's going to gradually get worse over a hundred years, maybe much worse. But what I didn't get from your talk really was what I'd call resilience. That is, so if I have a dollar in my pocket. And I do like Washington having that dollar, actually, because I don't want a yeah. thousand different things. Then where do you spend the dollar? Do you raise all the power plants by 10 meters? Do you uh, abandon New Orleans? I mean, what do you actually do in a macro society to just make sure it all continues to work? Uh, those are good questions. Um, they're part of Maya Buchanan's thesis that she will be working on. Um, I think my, uh, you know, I, I have shied away from getting too far into, ad into the adaptation side because I think that's going to be the focus of Michael Oppenheimer's talk in two weeks. Um, so you should come in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sea level rise shouldn't affect winds. Um, that's an inter yeah, that's a. I I don't think we have evidence of an increase in winds. You you might expect it if you saw an increase in thermal gradients. Um, so I'm going to speculate probably not because in fact what we see is a decrease uh, globally in, in temperature gradient because the poles warm faster than lower latitudes. So decreasing that might actually um, decrease winds, but I'm completely speculating here. So I have no idea. Yeah. Other questions? David. So uh, correct me if, my, if I'm wrong, but my impression of the, the literature from uh, Heinrich events, uh, which are uh, events of rapid sea level rise yeah. during the ice age, are that the sea level rise during those was much higher than anything you can explain by you know anything we see going on today or anything our models can really uh, explain. So 
you know, if I were a betting person, I would think that the sea level rise at the end of the century would be much more than, than is predicted based on these things in the past. Do you think mm -hmm. that's wrong? Um, I think my, 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 my beta value is definitely not one. So I think our, our PDFs are conservative. And part of the reason they're conservative is they were intentionally constructed to agree in the central part of the distribution with the IPCC. Um, you know, Heinrich events happened at a time when you had the, a big ice sheet in North America. So I don't know how much we can extrapolate from them. Um, but yeah, certainly there are examples in the recent geological past of periods when you have four meters a century of sea level rise. Um, but those did happen when you know, there was still a large ice sheet in North America um, and much more ice on the planet overall. So um, yeah, so, so I, I wouldn't advocate for for saying I had, it's, it, the worst case scenario is the most likely, but I would advocate, you know, the reason why I bring up these decision making under deep uncertainty issues is that I do think this is a, a question where we don't know, we certainly don't know the true PDF. We know a very reasonable and justifiable PDF, but that PDF could be, could be wrong. And we should build that into our decisions. Yeah. Um, most of the times when I hear people talk about climate change in ocean chemistry, it has to do with pH from increased carbon. If you're putting this much more water in the oceans, uh, are there other important changes in the ocean's chemistry? So it's a lot of water in terms of mass, but remember the, the oceans average a little, little over 2,000 meters deep. And so you're talking about a you know, one in 2,000 change in the amount of water in the ocean. Is there any yeah, David, 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 on. David wants to, David, who, who knows a whole lot more about pH, pH changes than I do and taught me most of what I know. Well, I was going to say that uh, the uh, feedback that Hansen is pointing to, which uh, oh, yes. wasn't on your list, was that if you dump a lot of fresh water yep. into the ocean from an ice sheet, it stratifies the water near the ice sheet, yep. making it colder at the surface but warmer at the Bottom, line, right. and this could be a positive Stable, yeah. feedback that could explain the Heinrich events yeah. and also would uh, predict much higher sea level rates for our section. Sure. In terms of pH and half, yeah. 